Uh, right, it is time to begin this talk, which you can see, extreme ring dials, uh, diamonds are a girl's best friend. The other day, I came across a photograph of two of my sundial clients taken together uh, before some grand dinner. And in the interest of client confidentiality, I have degraded this photograph and I shall be very circumspect about what I say about these clients. So I will just note that in terms of spending power, the client on the left makes the client on the right seem like an impoverished old lady. <laughs> I will, for mnemonic reasons, add that the client on the left lives just a whisker north of the Tropic of Cancer. If you are in the position of the client on the left, uh, it is your custom, your culture, uh, to do a lot of entertaining and as your guests leave, uh, you give them gifts. And to this end, you maintain a gift room. Now, around the world there are various people who have got to know about these gift rooms and regard them as marketing opportunities. Now, all this goes some way to explaining a mysterious phone call I had. Hello? My name is Anna da Costa. I am a jeweller speaking from Hatton Garden. Do you know how to use a ring sundial? It sure beats being asked about payment protection insurance. <laughs> and Anna explained uh, some of the background I have just given you and said that she had been sent a commercially made ring sundial made by a company called Nomos. Here it is. And she'd been asked whether she could make this out of solid platinum and have it encrusted in precious stones. That would be no problem to her. The difficulty was that she couldn't get it to work. Now, I should perhaps explain that to use one of these ring dials, you first slide the hole so it's in the right position on the date scale. Uh, and you then hold the thing down from long loop of string, you see the bottom loop there, very important that it's hanging plumb vertical, you twist the string so the hole is in the direction of the sun, and then with the ring vertical you note the position of a spot of light on the inside surface of the ring, and then you read off the time from the hour numbers provided, uh, morning hours on the left, afternoon hours on the right. The only snag is uh, but this uh, kind of sundial uh, is inherently mnemonically unsound. So I sympathized with Anna uh, and said we could probably uh, come up with something slightly better. Now, before going any further, I should note that this arch-like structure through which the piece of string goes is known to jewellers as a bale. That's how Anna spells it. Other jewellers I've since discovered spell it B-A-L-E. Take your pick. Now, the kind of ring sundial that I had in mind is something more like this. This was designed by Helmut Sonderegger, who I'm delighted to say is with us and going to talk to us uh, during this conference. Because it was designed by Helmut, this is mnemonically sound and uh, it has within it a proper dial with our lines and other recognizable features. All good news. Um, it also has a moving hole, just like the Nomos dial, and one of the properties of this sliding hole is that you get um, 12 o'clock always in a straight line, uh, but the horizon line is a sort of diagonal. Well, I was um, quite keen to dispense with the hole uh, if I could. The client lives in a part of a world where there is a rather a lot of um, sand, uh, and I imagine this interfering with the smooth operation of a slide. So, in my outline description to Anna, 
uh, I said I will try and go for a fixed hole. And here is the start of my embryonic cross-section of the dial which I was proposing. Uh, I have a schematic bail at the top and I have encircled this with position angles so that I can set where a particular point on the ring is. Reference zero at the top. I've made two design decisions. First, I've decided to have a fixed hole. Secondly, I've decided on its position. Position angle 315 degrees, 45 degrees anti-clockwise round from the top, if you prefer. Now let's introduce the sun, starting with the sun on the horizon. No, let's first look at the inside surface. Um, I'm opening it out, dropping the left-hand side down, uh, and you can see it's a featureless inside surface at the moment, apart from the hole, and I've added for position angles. Oh, by the way, I regard every ring sundial as having unit radius. You can, of course, choose the unit, um, and the width, though, you relate to the radius. And in this case, here's the radius, and the width is exactly one radius, in this case. Uh, it can be arbitrary, and in the dials that we actually made for the client, um, the radius and the width were both about 10 millimeters. Here is the sun coming in horizontally. You get a shaft of light, um, and because it's coming in from the horizon, altitude of the sun zero, the spot lands at position angle 45 degrees. You can see the spot on the inside surface. Now, let's increase the solar altitude 30 degrees at a time. And in increasing the altitude 30 degrees at a time, uh, the spot position increases 60 degrees at a time. I'll let you work out why. And this pretty much shows you all that a ring dial can do. It's a very simple instrument. Uh, and certainly this shows you uh, the entire range of possible spot positions on the center line. Really all a ring sundial can do is to tell you the solar altitude, and that's not sufficient to be able to tell you the time. To tell the time, you need also to know the local geographical latitude uh, and the solar declination. Now, you build one of these sundials for a specific latitude, and uh, at least you can deem the latitude to be fixed. And in this example, I'm going to be taking the latitude as the Tropic of Cancer. I'm talking about extreme ring dials, and that's an extreme case. Uh, but you can't build for a fixed solar declination, at least not usefully. So we need to add a second dimension to take account of the declination. And there are various ways of doing this. Now I'm going to start with what I call Scheme A, a very naive way of dealing with declination. And this is done via wrapping this up in a rectangular grid. Remind you, up, down, tells you altitude, and that comes from the instrument. Left, right, uh, is going to attend to declination, and that's something you have to know, directly or indirectly. Now, one indirect way of knowing about declination is to let L for left stand for the 1st of January, and R for right to stand for the 31st of December, and let a whole year run um, from one extreme to the other. Now, that would be fine if I had lots of width, but I don't. The width of a dial area is a mere six millimeters, and I had to put in a great deal of thought to try and to get all the information I wanted into a tiny dial without compromising readability. So I settled for left to right being just the normal range of solar declinations, about minus 30, uh, 23 and a half degrees to plus 23 and a half degrees, and I thereby relabeled these grid lines. Um, W for winter solstice, S for summer solstice, E obviously standing for declination zero, uh, the equinoxes. Well, this gives me a dial in which I can uh, put out hour lines. And I'm going to um, construct the hour lines in a slightly wacky way. I'm going to start with a day of a winter solstice and just take two times a day, nine o'clock in the morning and 12 noon. 
And in scheme A, I insist on the spot position being on the center line. Oops, what's it doing here? Control home. So, right, 9 and 12. So, I'm insisting on the spots being on the centre line, but I label in the left-hand margin against W for winter solstice. And so that's where the sun is at 9 in the morning and 12 noon, on the day of winter solstice at the latitude of the Tropic of Cancer. Now I go to the other extreme, which is the summer solstice, and I go for... 6, 9, and 12 this time. Again, I've got the spots on the centre line. And because it's a Tropic of Cancer, at 12 noon, the sun is straight overhead, altitude 90 degrees or thereabouts. So the spot is right at the bottom of the centre line. The numbers are in the right-hand margin against the summer solstice grid line. Then I go to the equinoxes, and here's 6, 9, and 12. Again, 6 o'clock in the morning, uh, sun rises on the horizon line at 6 o'clock, so spots at the top, uh, and now we have 9 and 12 like that. Slightly strange way of starting my laying out, but I can clearly put in intermediate points and const can construct nice, smooth uh, R lines like this. 6, 9, and 12. And... Clearly, the next step is to do some intermediate hour lines uh, and tidy up the labels. And here you see uh, I've used the NOMOS convention. I've got morning hours on the left, afternoon hours on the right, and so 8 and um, 16 are opposite ends of the same line. The sun rises in the morning and then goes down again, uh, and so you get this ambiguity. You have to know whether you're before or afternoon. Obviously, 12 o'clock straddles the two uh, like that. And this is pretty much what I handed over to Anna as a um, basis for working up into an item of jewellery, but not quite all, uh, because the client wanted Islamic prayer times. Now, at least for daytime prayers, and so I thought, well, it's easy enough. Look, the uh, Duhur prayer, midday prayer, uh, is already dealt with for free by the 12 o'clock line, so I don't need to do anything there. Instead, you have to pray just after 12 o'clock. If you dare pray spot on 12 o'clock when the sun is at transit, that is hira, an executable offence. So you've got to be very careful when using these instruments. You don't slightly misread. Um, uh, the um, night of the evening prayer said at sunset, just after sunset for similar reasons. Well, that's dealt with by the horizon line, so I've got that for free as well. That's another reason for having a horizon line rather than a, a sloping horizon line. That leaves only the mid-afternoon prayer, Asa. And so we've dealt with Maghrib, we've dealt with Tahur, and so Asa um, I dealt with separately. And so I'm going to put all these in in red. Uh, the uh, strange line, um, I checked that the client used Asa 1, as dialists call it, though no Muslim ever talks about Asa 1. Uh, and you can see the line there. And these are the three altitudes, um, winter, summer, uh, winter, equinox, summer, for the time of the Asa prayer. So this is what Anna actually used. Let's see how, under scheme A, we would actually use this sundial if you wanted to know when it was time to pray for Asa. Let's suppose um, it is uh, the equinox, day of an equinox. You've watched during the course of the morning uh, the spot go all the way down to the 12 noon equinox, and then it goes back up again, and when it reaches this point, it's time for the Asa prayer. Now, if you want to know what the time of day is, you notice that we're not quite halfway between 15 and 16. Uh, and so the time is about 15.25, uh, say 25 past 3 in the afternoon. Now, if we want to know when Asa is at the time of the winter solstice, uh, we have to let the spot rise a bit further uh, to this position, because I'm still insisting on using the centre line. Um, you 
wait until the spot is on the same level as the top end of the Asa line, now it's time for your Asa prayer. And if you want to know what time of day it is, then you note that we're pretty well coincident with the 9 o'clock hour line, but of course it's an afternoon prayer, Asa literally means afternoon, and so the actual time is 15 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And about this time, you will be saying, why on earth? Do I insist on the spot being on the centre line? Why can't it, you arrange for the user to have, on the day of a winter solstice, let the spot track um, down and up the winter solstice line? Two points here. First, be careful what you wish for. And secondly, right, let's go for it and see what happens. I now embark on scheme B. And I go back to this um, embryonic grid, and here I have the sun on the horizon, and just for a moment, the spot at the top end of the equinoctial grid line. Now, no question, you're dangling this piece of string, things hanging vertically, you can just twist it a little bit to one side or the other, uh, and you can make the spot move to one side, like this on the winter solstice grid line, or this on the summer solstice grid line. Uh, you can certainly do that, at least in theory. Remember the thing's only six millimeters wide and you've got a meter of string. You actually find this quite difficult, but never mind. If you really want the spot on the winter solstice line, you can certainly do it, at least in theory. Now, these three spots are collinear, they're in a straight line, horizontal line, which I've been calling the horizon line. Uh, no problems so far. Now, I s trust there'll be no great problem when I do the equivalent diagram for the solar altitude of 30 degrees. Um, the spots are no longer in a horizontal straight line, but really no great surprises there. The central spot is slightly higher than the two flanking spots. And the easiest way to reason about this is to imagine the ring being clamped into a fixed position and the sun going round the rim of a well-chosen cone, uh, like this. The vertex of the cone is the hole, the axis of the cone is vertical, and the half angle of the cone is the complement of the solar altitude. Uh, in this case, it would be 60 degrees, the altitude being 30 degrees. Now, when the spot is on the center line, the sun is at the extreme left-hand part of the rim, as seen on this diagram. As the spot moves, as the sun moves just a tiny bit round the rim, then obviously the spot moves to one side and drops slightly. You have the intersection of a cone and a cylinder. Now you've all seen constant altitude curves before. On a plane surface they are hyperbolas. Well, this is an approximation to a hyperbola. Pretty close approximation, but not exact. Uh, and so my constant altitude curve is this little curve here. So when we go up to 60 degrees, um, the intersection of the cone and the cylinder. The cone, of course, is the inverse of the cone I've drawn up there, so it's a cone going round at the bottom. The cylinder, of course, is the inside surface of the ring. Uh, the only change here of significance is that the curvature is slightly increased. Uh, nothing surprising. Uh, the fun comes when we go to up another 30 degrees to 90 degrees, uh, when the intersection of a cone and the cylinder is a point. Because the sun is straight overhead. And no matter how much you twiddle the ring, this shaft of light just drills a hole in that fixed spot and you can't make it budge to one side or the other. We are, of course, at the sub-solar point. And if you've never visited the subsolar point, I strongly recommend it as a vacation exercise. It's like this. Your shadow takes on the most extraordinary appearance. And more exciting still is if you do a pirouette, your shadow goes round with you, which is not what ordinarily happens uh, with your shadow when you're walking along and you turn right into another street. This is extremely entertaining to you as a demonstrator, but also to the people in the cafe behind. <laughs> 
obviously, being at the subsolar point uh, is a very special case. But even if we back off 10 degrees to an altitude of 80 degrees, we still have an intractable problem. Here is the constant altitude curve for 80 degrees, and you see it doesn't reach for flanking grid lines. Indeed, the ends of the line are starting to converge. Indeed, if we extend this curve mathematically, uh, we find that it <coughs> joins up on the center line, giving us another candidate spot position. Uh, here is what's going on. We've got a very tight cone, and so that when the cone intersects the cylinder, it's so narrow that the intersection is wholly contained within the width of the ring. Moreover, it's wholly contained within the width of the dial area that I've been asked to work with, uh, and so there are no intersections, and so I can't mark <coughs> even an 11 o'clock um, hour line, never mind, a 10 o'clock hour line. Scheme B is rapidly starting to fail on me. And you say, well, look, these are extraordinarily high altitudes you're dealing with. This is not going to be a problem uh, in lower latitudes, or higher latitudes. Well, look, this is a 60 degree curve, and all is not entirely well, even with a 60 degree altitude curve, and that applies in Britain in high summer. Uh, if I extend that, uh, we see. Sure, it goes off the edge, but it comes back in again. No problem with this little ring dial, but if you wanted to go wider, <coughs> you'd be stuck, even in British latitudes, <coughs> with the 60 degree curve. Even an ever so modest altitude of 30 degrees is not wholly satisfactory. That comes back in again too, and you get this curious loop down there. Uh, this spot I have to admit, it is a bit academic. It comes about from that point there, which is actually between the sun and the hole, so you can't really get it. But that's how it, the, the mathematics is absolutely delightful, splendid trigonometry going on here. Uh, it took me two days to realize it was trivial. Now, <coughs> you get these nice shapes, uh, and although scheme B is utterly delightful geometrically, it isn't actually much use for the extreme ring dials that I'm trying to make. Can it be rescued? Well, it, yes, it sort of can, but it's a most unsatisfactory solution. Uh, you can take the hole from the center position and then shift it sideways like that in a trouble, and now all will be okay. Uh, but this is horribly clutching at straws, it's um, not at all satisfactory, and we didn't decide to pursue this. So what Anna actually did uh, was to uh, use scheme A, which I showed you before. So that's what we actually worked with. But only after she chipped off the finished product did I have a light bulb moment. And I realized that you could improve scheme A to what I shall call scheme A dashed. And what you do is to make the observation that you don't need a notice at all. The hole, the aperture notice, we're using uh, the hole in the side of a ring. Instead, you can use a gnomon. Some of you will be thinking, how on earth can you use a gnomon on such a microscopic ring dial such as I have in mind. And that's because you have brainwashed yourselves into thinking that a gnomon has to be polar oriented. Take it from me, unless it's been made or sold by a, a, a um, garden center, sundials which have gnomons which are not polar oriented are much more interesting than ones which are polar oriented. I have in mind an aperture gnomon. And that takes the form of a slot in the ring going through where the hole was, like this. And because we've got a slot no on, you get a sort of mini strip light um, shining on the inside surface of the ring. And you use this as a cursor, just as you use a cursor on one of those slide rules you have gathering dust in a drawer somewhere. So that um, here it is on the day of the 
time for Asa on the day of an equinox, and here it is. No, it's a, yes, here it is, Asa in a day of. That's right, that's for winter solstice. This is uh, an equinox, and this is for summer solstice. You just move it up and down. Every time you make an observation, you have to make sure that this mini strip light is straddling the two flanking grid lines, uh, winter and summer. Uh, but uh, that's an easy enough to do, and then you just use whichever end of the, whichever part of the grid line, it, whichever part end of it cursor is relevant. Uh, and this, of course, works perfectly well, um, even in this very special case when the sun is at 90 degrees. So a banal um, force of scheme B, um, it really isn't at all um, satisfactory. And so I'll now. I um, think it's time to visit my favourite workshop, otherwise known as the Grand Tea Room in Fortnum and Mason, which is where Anna usually entertained me during the um, development stage. And here, amongst the teapots and the cups, you can see one of my diagrams. Uh, augmented this time with red spots, which are my best uh, attempt at representing rubies. Uh, and you can see on the left a commercial novel style, the thing I showed you early on. And here is a very early prototype made by Anna. At this stage, there is no bale and no hole. All we were interested was to see whether the engravings were readable. And here is a close-up taken a few moments later. I fear uh, where is Mike Cowan when you want him? My attempts to photograph this were hopeless, but I think you can just about see there's a, a kind of dial inside with numbers associated with it. Uh, I felt it could be made more readable, and indeed in due course it was made more readable. This was a very early attempt. Um, here is a slightly later prototype, uh, complete with hole, and you can see the spot of light from the real sun, this is out in the open, uh, and it's falling on the centre line as required by scheme A. And here's one with a bale. Now, eventually, uh, Anna actually started making production uh, ring sundials, and she was wise enough to engage a professional Hatton Garden photographer rather than me. Uh, and he took a number of photographs. Here's um, one of them. Uh, this is um, emerald set into platinum. So, ladies, should the man in your life ask you what you want for your birthday, you could suggest one of these. Uh, and if he says it's a tad expensive, he would be right. And you could say, all right, I'll settle for something cheaper, which is rubies in um, rose gold. Now, these things are very pretty pretty, but all through this project I was hankering after something wider. Uh, and inspiration came via my Christmas bonus, which was a Fortnum and Mason hamper inside of which you will be imagining there are lots of nice things to eat and drink. But I have a one-track mind. I opened it up and all I saw was a basket full of sundials, and my eye particularly feasted on this thing here. And let's have a look at it a bit closer, and indeed let's have a look at it for real. Now, this has an aspect ratio more to my liking. Instead of being just one radius wide, this is 11 radii wide. Ha! Just think what I could do with this. But I hear you thinking, this will be incredibly impractical. How on earth would you mark out the inside? And even if you could mark out the inside, how would you make it usable? You just couldn't see the spot. Ah, oh, well. I'm imagining this scaled up. So instead of being two inches in diameter, I'm imagining something two meters in diameter so you can climb inside and mark it out and indeed, of course, make your observations. Of course, you couldn't have it dangling on a piece of string uh, because when you walked along and reached the tipping point, you would be discharged unceremoniously um, outside the upper end. Uh, you need to have it mounted on some kind of heavy-duty turntable. 
And it was then that I had another light bulb moment. I knew exactly what I needed. I wanted one of these. <laughs> and so, chaps, if your lady asks you what you want for your birthday, you could say you want something like this. Remember, as far as I'm concerned, if it's outdoors, it either is a sundial, or it can be readily adapted into a sundial. And all you have to do is to remove the boiler end plates, strip out the inside, drill a hole somewhere around there. And you might have to ask one or two of the men to move gently to one side, but most of them could say where they are. They might just ask you what you were doing, uh, but then you got yourself uh, a splendid sundial. I can see one or two of you are slightly uncomfortable about this proposal, and you have probably spotted the snag. The snag is these ring dials are supposed to be portable. What do you do if you have a sudden urge to tell the time and you're a long way from one of these turntables? Ah, well, US railroad engineers have thought of that one. What you do is you carry your turntable around with you and you have it underslung and you jack yourself up. Let's have a look at a proof of concept. And here you see, you see four members of the North American Sundial Society undertaking a feasibility, feasibility study, and no doubt if the trials are successful, they'll remove the seats from the back and replace them with an appropriate cylinder. And I have some tips and suggestions as to how this cylinder should be marked out. I go back to my diagram showing constant altitude curves for a dial which is one radius wide. Now let's increase it to 11 radii wide where we can see much better what's going on. And I now have the altitudes at 15 degree intervals. And you get these delightful loops. This one goes off the bottom, reappears at the top. Remember this is a cylinder, so the top and the bottom are joined. Uh, now, the constant altitude curves are dictated by the geometry. There's not much you can do about them. Moreover, they apply at every latitude. Uh, and, uh, of course, in British latitudes, we don't have to worry too much about altitudes over 60, uh, but the curves are the same. Now, you can add power lines, sorry, uh, constant declination lines, you have much more scope as to how you put them in. I'm going to be quite straightforward and just put some boring grid lines in for a moment, but I won't have them labelled. Pause. Would you pay good money for graph paper looking like this? It is extremely unsettling plotting points on graph paper where a given grid line can intersect a given constant altitude curve in up to four separate places just isn't a sound thing to do. Sure, you can say a lot of this is academic. I can certainly get rid of everything downstream of the 90 degree mark. Like this. That tidies things up somewhat, but I still have ambiguities. Really isn't terribly satisfactory. Never mind. Uh, let's see what happens if we try it out. And let's start again trying it out for the special case of the Tropic of Cancer. Now, I'm going to have five grid lines this time. The idea is to go from one winter solstice to the next, spanning a whole year. I've got all this width, I want to exploit it. This arrangement has the summer solstice grid line in the centre, so it's lined with the whole. So scheme B should be viable. Um, I can let the spot run all the way to the 90 degree mark on the day of the summer solstice. Everything's starting to look okay. Uh, that's fine for 12 noon on the day of the summer solstice, but what about 12 noon at other times of year? Well, let's consider the equinoxes and the winter solstice. What you have to do is to arrange, first of all, you have to calculate the solar altitude at noon on the day of the equinoxes and on the day of the winter solstice and plot the corresponding constant altitude curves. This is just a sort of sanity check. Here they are. And you discover that neither of these curves 
even reaches the equinoctial grid lines, never mind the winter solstice grid line. No intersections at all, it fails. I can't do it. Scheme B is no good. Unless I drag in the grid lines towards the centre. And I have to drag them in a long way before I get the appropriate intersections as far as the equinoxes are concerned. Thereby wasting all this lovely space on my scaled up biscuit tin that I was hoping to use. So I'm finding scheme B something of a disappointment. Of course, as you move northwards, you don't have to worry, or you have to, the, the highest altitude that you have to deal with gradually decreases, uh, and so the constraints steadily reduce. And when you reach 53 degrees north, not much further north than me, uh, the equivalent diagram is like this. Now I am using most of the width, by no means all of this, and I'm only just surviving there are the intersections that I require there and there. And so this is distinct possibilities. Certainly, I could mark in our lines as required uh, and put in some nice labels and some grid lots and lots of intermediate grid lines and work this up into a complete design. But then a whole lot of light bulbs go out. How would I actually use this instrument? You see, the problem is that a spot doesn't track down a grid line all by itself. Every time you make an observation, you have to ensure that the spot is on the relevant grid line. Now, you are outside pushing this great cylinder round, and the spot and the relevant grid line are on the inside and you would very soon find this an incredibly painful procedure. You would not enjoy using this sort of sundial. All of a sudden, my original insistence on having a spot on the center line starts to seem a good deal more attractive. Why? Because you can get the spot on the center line without looking at the spot or the center line at all. Because in the special case of a spot being on the centre line, the axis of a cylinder is at right angles to the line to the sun. And you can judge a right angle reasonably precisely by eye. You can then double check by ensuring that the penumbral light getting at each end exactly matches. And then just to be doubly sure, you deliberately turn the thing a tiny bit more um, clockwise, seen from above, than is necessary. And then you clamp the turntable, climb inside, and watch the spot creep up to the centre line. It's all quite doable. But you can't do that with this design, except on the day of the summer solstice. Any other time of year, it doesn't work. Once again, scheme B seems to fail us. So with great reluctance, despite the elegance of the curves and the geometry, I concluded that scheme B isn't useful even in uh, British latitudes in extreme cases, where I want lots of width. So, I deemed it we had to resort to groups. Now we're going to be going to scheme uh, B. So I scheme A dashed, where I have now a truly enormous aperture gnomon and uh, equivalent long strip light effect as the cursor. Now, by comparison with the um, elegant curves of the um, scheme B, this is incredibly boring. But you can make it a lot more interesting by chopping it up. And cutting a long story short, what I mean is something like this. And this is more or less a complete design for the Tropic of Cancer. You see, the great thing is it works even in extreme cases. Here is a 12 o'clock line going down to the 90 degree point, or 225 degrees position angle, on the day of the summer solstice. Uh, I've chopped this up into 12 parts, so effectively I've got 12 separate sundials, um, and 12 separate gnomons, and 12 separate grid lines. Now this is the uh, cursors, this is all very easy to use because uh, you just need to peep in at one end, check that the uh, January cursor, or position in the, in the January uh, 
sundial is roughly in position, then climb inside and um, let it coat into an absolute right position and all works nicely. And this, of course, will work at any latitude too. Once you've done this, then your imagination can rip. You can do anything you like. Um, with no constraints on width or latitude. And in particular, if you're the sort of person who likes a mean time sundial, then why not modify these curves by the equation of time? Now, one of the problems, of course, of using the equation of time in an ordinary sundial is the ambiguity. You need to know whether the declination is increasing or decreasing, which, whether you use the S part of the analemma or the reverse S part of the analemma. Well, we don't have that ambiguity here. Uh, because I'm going all through the year, from January to December, so I can explicitly deal with each day of the year uh, appropriately. But I do, alas, need to worry about a different ambiguity. Am I in the morning or, or the afternoon? Uh, because if I modify these curves to take into account the equation of time, I need to know whether it's morning modification or afternoon modification. So you actually need 24 sundials. Here are the morning sundials. Uh, and you'll see a curious phenomenon, which will instantly be spotted by Kevin Carney. You see um, the 12 o'clock line disappears about the 15th of April, about a week or two ago. Uh, and it vanishes only to re-emerge in late June. What's going on? Well, of course, the problem is that because of the equation of time, um, clock noon, or local mean time, is not until after solar transit. And so that will count as afternoon. And if we look at the afternoon sundials, uh, we find that part of the curve suddenly reappears, uh, and all is well. Now, how do we organize this? Do you actually need a huge wide thing? Well, no, not quite. What I imagine looking at my cross section is that we use the hole that I've been using all along uh, as the aperture nodus or aperture gnomon in the mornings, and we have the appropriate 12 sun morning sundials on the right, and we make another hole on the right for afternoon sundials on the left, and every day at 12 noon you whiz the thing around 180 degrees um, to change sides. Now, here are the, um, for my latitude, this is the amount of um, dial on the uh, day of the summer solstice. I need to go from naught to just over 60 degrees. That means just over 120 degrees of um, position angle, which doesn't take me up to 180, so they don't meet at the bottom. And if you go towards the Tropic of Cancer, of course, these red lines increase. So you'd need to take the um, holes nearer the top. And if you really do want to go to the Tropic of Cancer, I have to accept that it's not very satisfactory, but you could have a single hole at the top. Um, so it, can, it is doable. But back to my latitude, um, there's another possibility crops up. Suddenly it occurs to me, I'm looking at the lid of a teapot, and since I'm no longer having a bale, I've got everything mounted on a massive turntable shown schematically down at the bottom, uh, then I can remove the lid, and instead of using having aperture gnomons, I can use an edge gnomon. And so this is quite nice, because you see, during the course of the morning, um, you're starting at sunrise with the um, whole of the right-hand side in shadow. As the sun rises, the right-hand side gradually gets more and more light on it, and the day of the summer solstice, it gets wholly illuminated up to there. Then you whiz the thing around to the afternoon times, and gradually darkness creeps up um, on the other side. So it, it's sort of a metaphor for the day, all quite elegant. Uh, and um, Another way of thinking of this is to say, well, look, and this is going back to the helmet sonderator design, where you want a moving hole, you can have the effect of a moving hole without any moving parts. Because I'm looking here at a cross section, and you can think of every single cross section of this long thing being a separate sundial. And so you really are designing each sundial for a specific um, solar declination. And there's no reason why I can't um, lower the holes so all these exactly go meet at the bottom. And that means that the 12 o'clock uh, local apparent time line is a straight line right at the bottom of this uh, cylinder. 
And of course, the edges would be all wiggly. But now, because you've got so much light coming in, uh, we, can, we can take the top off. This doesn't have to be full size. I really could do that with a biscuit tin, and you look down uh, and have it nice and portable. But if you had it full size, this would make an ideal thing for a children's playground. Um, it would be great fun to use. It would be educational. Uh, it has moving part. You can swing it round. And you can imagine the things you can do with it. You could get 20 small boys in here and have one pushing it round so they all fly out at the ends. Uh, and then when you let go, it would bash you in the back. It would be lovely and dangerous. Small boys would love it. Um, so I commend that to you as something for you to ponder. Uh, that's all for me. And we now have a lemonses, I think. Coffee break. So, Chris. Yeah.